Hello everyone. So yes, I, I will, uh, I'll cover a bit of downstream analysis with the data sets that we have been generated, generating in, in the past modules. And I'll cover like integrative and online tools, stuff that you can, the online resources where you can find data sets, where you can, online resources that you can use to help you analyze your data set and these kind of things. So the learning objectives in, the, in this module are well, first, to explore components of downstream analysis that can be done with epigenomic acid uh, data. Then we'll discover sources of publicly available data sets that can be used in anyone's project. Identify challenges of using public data sets in one's analysis. And finally, learn about online portals and tools that can ease epigenomic data analysis. So we'll start by talking a bit about downstream uh, functional analysis, then we'll move on with to uh, working with public data sets, challenges of large scale uh, analysis, online visualization and analysis tools, and at, at the end uh, we'll cover an introduction of the, uh, the Galaxy platform to run a lot of the tools that we've covered in the workshop so far through a, uh, through a web interface. So downstream functional analysis. Well, this is like just repeating a lot of what's been said, what's been said, said so far. But like genes, the genome account for two percent of the, the, the overall genome. That means that ninety-eight percent of the, the genome does not encode for protein sequences. Uh, however, like more than three fourths of the genome gets transcribed. So nearly half of the genome is accessible through, uh, through uh, genetic regulatory proteins, such as uh, uh, transcription factors. So like putting in context information that we have on uh, variants, methylation uh, profile, uh, histone modification, transcription, and, and so on, uh, can, can help ease our understanding of the underlying biology. So, um, with what, with what we've done so far, we've covered uh, chip seq analysis, methylation analysis. Uh, so once we've done the, uh, once we're done executing the tools that we've covered in the lab, we have, for instance, a set of peak calls uh, for uh, for a chip seq assay. We have methylation level at CPG sites for bisulfite sequencing assays. So next, we can use this data to run some functional analysis by, for instance, comparing different regions from the same data set, multiple samples of the same group, or comparing different groups together. Uh, Guillaume has covered that, uh, that already uh, th this morning. But in, for instance, for methylation, uh, we've got, uh, <coughs> uh, we, uh, once we get the methylation profile for one given experiment, we can push things a bit further by, uh, for instance, comparing differentially methylated sites across samples, uh, across uh, groups of samples, across regions on, on, on the genome, and so on. Uh, so I, I, I put one example of, of, of such integrative analysis that's been done, so that, that this from a paper uh, uh, from the, the Roadmap Consortium published a couple of years ago, uh, where um, components of different types of epigenomic assays were put together to compare different re regions of the uh, of the genome uh, b based on the, the type of region the, the, what uh, what represented like the, the what, what was the, the, the DNA methylation uh, like so class, class, classifying things such as uh, regions by profiles of DNA methylation uh, chip seq DNA accessibility and, and so on and. Another thing that we can do, for instance, with uh, ChIP-seq data, well, we've talked a lot about, uh, about ChIP-seq in, uh, in, 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 in the past modules. And th this kind of experiment can, uh, can help us identify uh, motifs on the genome. Uh, motifs are uh, short recurring patterns of, of DNA uh, in the DNA that are presumed to have some kind of biological function. 
a, a motif doesn't have to be, it's usually a series of, letter, uh, of, of, of bases, uh, a series of, of uh, nucleotides that repeat in the, in, in the genome. They don't have to be exactly the same from uh, one to the other, but can uh, allow for slight differences. So uh, it often indicates like that a, a, a binding site, for instance, for transcription factors to allow you to, to bind to to start uh, transcribing a region of the genome. So like in this, in, in this example, if I allow for one base mismatch, there are two motifs in the, in the sequence I'm, I'm providing here. Um, and I, these are highlighted in, in the black and the, in bold black and blue. So using regions previously labeled as peaks, like we've done previously by using MAX2, we can try to identify motifs. Uh, identif identifying transcription factor binding sites can be useful for such, an, such thing as understanding regulatory network transcription mechanism and so on. So we'll cover that in the lab later, in the, the, the last lab of uh, the, this, this workshop. We'll, we'll run the tool called uh, Homer. Homer is a, is a, uh, a motif uh, finding tool which tries to identify regulatory elements enriched in, uh, in one set of sequence compared to another. So it allows for discovery of uh, known motifs. So it has its own database of, of existing known motifs and also tries to, to identify the novel motifs. So motifs which are not in the database but that are identified as, as a recurring pattern in the sequences provided to the software. And then it, yeah, it, it, it attempts to match them to known, uh, known uh, <coughs> uh, patterns that are uh, already uh, identified. So the command we will use in the, in, in the module is called uh, find multi genomes. And it's, um, it attempts to identify motifs provided in the list of the genomic regions. So the input, the input file is basically a bed file. Uh, I, we've covered a, a bit uh, in the workshop what bed files are. So basically it's a, it's a, a file containing, a, basically it's a list of regions in the genome uh, uh, with like at, le at least six columns. Uh, bed actually can have like a main type of conf configuration, but the one, uh, uh, the, the usual one, the one expected by Homer is like the first column will be uh, the chromosome uh, and then st start and standing uh, and ending position. A unique peak ID, column five is, is, is just ignore, and column six is the strand where this, uh, where this region was uh, identified. And uh, we need also to provide a reference genome assembly and a, a, a fragment size to try to identify the motifs. So what Homer does is it will verify uh, peaks provided in the bed file that you, that you give as, as an input. It will extract sequences from the genome corresponding to the regions in the input file. It will calculate uh, the CG, CPG content of peak sequences, pre-parse genomic uh, sequences of uh, the selected size to serve as background sequences, randomly select background regions for motif discovery, auto-normalize, check for enrichment of known motifs and try to identify the novel, meaning like new motifs. And then we'll get uh, um, in the exercise we'll do, we'll get two result file. Uh, well, we got more than that, but the, the two that interest are, that are interesting for us will be uh, the two HTML reports displaying known motifs identified in the in the bed file provided, and and, and the novel motifs. Another tool we'll cover in the lab later is uh, is great. Great is a, a an online tool. So you don't need to install anything. You can just run it from your web browser. It, what it does is it's looking for a significant Go enrichment. So uh, Go stands for gene ontology. Uh, and a gene ontology is a set of structured, uh, controlled vocabulary to, uh, to use in, uh, annota for, for annotating genes, uh, gene products, and sequences. So we'll cover this tool uh, shortly. <coughs> And while well, this is from the from the great paper, it's just saying that like uh, great looks beyond just the the, the really proximal region of uh, identifying these poor, to try to uh, identify uh, genes of interest. 
uh, what will provide for grade is uh, a bed file and basically that the, uh, the, uh, the reference genome that we want to run it on. Unfortunately, uh, grade is not that much up to date at the moment. Uh, it, it's not possible to run it on the uh, uh, reference genome uh, HG38. So uh, hopefully this will, that will be uh, addressed in the future. But for now, we'll run uh, a data set from the HG19 reference genome. And so what we'll get as an output is a list of code terms for things such as uh, molecular function, uh, biological processes, phenotypes, diseases, and so on. Um, this is an, an example. Well, we'll run this exact example later in, in, in the lab. But you, uh, this is an example of, of biological processes list that I can get by executing uh, the, the software with. Yes. So yeah, you you can you can provide whole genome and then it will just. Uh, yeah, consider the whole genome as a background. But you can also, uh, th there's, a, there's an option to specify a, a, a specific background that you want to be using. Uh, well, I've mentioned this already, but uh, the, it's talking about the uh, NIH roadmap uh, for as an example of integrative analysis uh, project. Um, next part is uh, working with public data sets. So there's, there, there is a available on the internet at the moment like a, a, a lot of a very large uh, <coughs> data sets that you can use to run your own analysis uh, against either against your own data set or just trying to uh, collect public data sets to answer questions that, that you're looking for. Uh, man, many of these uh, large consortia offer stuff such as like a in different diseases and different tissues and for, for different uh, phenotypes and so on. Uh, these resources are usually for free and can be used in anyone's project. Um, the, the down point to that is that there's absolutely no control over, uh, um, you don't have a con control over the, 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 the quality of the data set, how they're organized and this kind of thing. We'll come back a lot on, on, uh, on that uh, in this presentation. Uh, one of the uh, uh, for one of the uh, earlier uh, sources of for for uh, for epigenomic data set was the roadmap epigenome project, which has its 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 own portal where you can uh, navigate and and to discover reference epigenomes so that uh, for different type of tissues and 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 so on. And they even have this uh, this online resource called Jamboree where you can run. Uh, some bioinform bioinformatic analysis tools on data sets that are available. Um, there's, um, there's also the ENCODE consortium, which has its own, its own portal, offering, again, uh, uh, ChIP-seq, uh, methylation, uh, 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 RNA-seq, and, and all, all kinds of experience uh, of, uh, of assays run on a lot of cell types on both human and non-human data sets. Uh, the GTEx project um, is, is, is focusing on, on gene expression and trying to, to identify a relationship between uh, gen uh, genetic vari uh, variants and that, that gene expression. So uh, uh, if you're interested, the, the URL is provided here. And nowadays, the most, if I may say, complete uh, epigenetic resource to, to, to get data sets to work with is the International Human Epigenome Consortium, uh, in its short, in short, uh, IHEC. Uh, IHEC is an international effort, so it's basically a consortium of consortia. So uh, in Canada, there's the CERC, uh, which uh, which has uh, two, two nodes uh, producing da data. In the US, there's uh, there's ENCODE, that there used to be Roadmap. In the uh, in Europe, we've got the Deep and Blueprint. We've also got consortium from uh, Japan, Korea, Singapore, uh, Hong Kong, and so on. So IHEC, uh, IHEC's goal, the, 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 the primary goal is to provide uh, reference epigenomes for a variety of, of, of normal and disease tissue. So a reference epigenome is basically a, um, a set of assays 
which are uh, RNA-seq, whole genome by slide sequencing, and GIP-seq for uh, six histone marks. So, and I think Martin presented the, what are the, the considered to be the, the six main histone marks, which are uh, uh, fundamental to GIP-seq analysis. Uh, beyond that, IHEC is a, 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 a group of committees, a, a, a different work groups trying to work on, on standards to improve things such as the way to analyze your data sets, uh, how to better distribute the uh, produced data, how to run a successful integrative analysis, uh, work groups on ethics, and so on. And yeah, I'm just listing here the, uh, the assays uh, that, that, I, that I just mentioned, which are considered a core set of, of uh, epigenome assays. Yes? Uh, it's uh, so when what you could say a, a reference epigenome would be for one uh, one sample pooled or not usually not pooled but like a, one sample for one given tissue and then you have all of these assays run for uh, on 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 this sample so uh, it could be like uh, I don't know you extract B cells from the blood of indi one individual and on that sample you run whole genome based fat sequencing RNA seq all those just guesses. So it's a way to give you different ang epigenetic angles of the same the same data set. So and and, and usually the, so you get a, a a plethora of metadata identifiers to to know the, the condition of the subject. Is this a from a, a patient with a given disease, uh, like a, maybe a kind of age group and these kind of things. So like you can you can know that you can know that for an individual m matching those criteria. Uh, in this specific cell type, maybe, uh, the epigenetic profile would look like this. The, that's basically the goal of I, the main goal of IHEC, to offer these a uh, big picture of an, epigen of an epigenome. So, uh, as I was saying, uh, IHEC is a, a, a consortium of a consortia, meaning like data is, um, is organized uh, in a decentralized way. There's not like one central database uh, collecting everything and and, uh, uh, and and offering it to the to, to the community. So like it's it's basically up to each individual group. So if, if I imagine like a data com production group such, such as maybe the Canadian group would offer its data uh, its data sets on a given server, and all of these groups uh, are then storing the, their, their uh, data and metadata in controlled access repositories, so, so, such as the EGA. And then they run the analysis on the, uh, the raw data to produce what we call like process data. So the, this is data that's considered uh, non-personally uh, identify, uh, identifiable data, meaning that you can just release it on a website and there's no risk for the, the study participant of being re-identified. And these process data sets are offered uh, with, without, usually without, uh, without restriction for, for, for you to analyze. Then these data sets are, are, are uh, th these process data sets are, are uh, agglomerated in the, uh, uh, a, a portal published by IHEC, which is the, the IHEC data portal. Uh, users can go to the portal and, and visualize what IHEC has, has to offer, but ultimately what they will want is if they identify data sets of interest is to obtain the raw data to start uh, analyzing things on, on, on their own. What they have to do then is to apply to a data access committee at each of the, uh, of the institution that produce the data that they're looking for. And the data access committee will study the request, uh, maybe ask a few questions, and usually give you access to the data that you're looking for, for you to download it. So uh, uh, I'll talk uh, briefly about, about the, the IHEC data portal. So the goal of the portal is to integrate data set, the, the public data set, so like the process track, as I was saying before, published by, the, by IHEC. Uh, again, raw data is not available on the IHEC data portal because it's considered personally identifiable. So to protect privacy of, part, of study participants and these things, these data are stored at controlled access repositories and you have to, ap to apply to a DAC to, in order to obtain them. As of October 2017, uh, within IHEC, we've published so far over 10,000 
human data set. So that's like one, uh, one epigenomic assay for one given sample. Um, over 230 of them are, are, are non-human. And we have at the moment over 290 full reference epigenomes. So that means one, uh, one sample, one cell type, uh, all of the assays that I was uh, mentioning before. And there's data set from eight consortia at the moment. Uh, so the portal offers uh, tools uh, for data set discovery, visualization, and pre-analysis. We'll come back to that, to that a bit later. Um, recently, uh, from the, I the, 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 the main IHEC website, there's this, uh, there's this resource that started uh, uh, offering a directory of all epigenomic uh, analysis tools published by uh, different IHEC members. So there's, there's tools for data discovery, visualization, integrative analysis, and so on. So if you follow the URL provided here, uh, you, can, uh, you can get such a list of tools. It's, it's getting to, to be quite extensive. You can use the filtering options here to just select the, what's interesting for you. So I, I want to go back a bit on uh, the notion of, uh, of uh, public versus uh, uh, controlled access data. So data sets made by IHEC are, by definition, publicly accessible for anyone's research. But they basically fall in, in two categories, the first one being controlled access data. So that's the data, as I was saying, that's considered personally identifiable. These are raw data from the sequencers, so I'm talking about uh, FASTQs, uh, BAM files, and all of these, all of these things which are considered uh, uh, more, more sensitive uh, data. Uh, clinical and sensitive information such as phenotypes. So maybe if, I'm, uh, if I have a data set about rare disease and um, uh, there's, su sufficient, uh, there's enough information that would allow to potentially uh, re-identify a patient, this kind of data is supposed to be put in control access repositories. Um, these data are usually archived at sites such as uh, the European Genome, Genome Archive or dbGaP. And the public data is the de-identified de uh, annotation tracks such as uh, big beds, big wigs, uh, and, uh, and, and so on. To the kind of annotation that you can visualize in IGV, the UCSC Genome Browser, the, the WashU Browser, and so on. Some of the donor sample and library metadata is also considered uh, uh, public, uh, uh, fully public uh, meta information uh, when it's considered non personally identifiable, and these are freely downloadable. So, quality control on epigenomic data sets. Um, as I was mentioning, data sets exist in, uh, from uh, multiple sources. Uh, the, uh, the data you can obtain is uh, of uh, variable uh, levels of quality. So normally, if you want to do things properly in analysis, the first thing you should do is to assess the quality of this data. I, uh, we've seen one first example in, in, in this workshop, where uh, which is FASTQCs, where I can assess the quality of my read set uh, on, on, on FASTQ files. Uh, but, and there's other, uh, other flags that can be checked to, uh, to, uh, to identify if the data set seems good or not, such as looking for the uh, signal to noise ratio. I, I give an example here where two data sets coming from the same institution uh, for, for a, a, a chip seek experiment is, is in, in one case, it's showing like, uh, like clear piece. This is from a, a, a very uh, uh, zoomed out level. That's why the, the, peak, the peaks look so thin here. But in, in other cases, you can see like that there's much more background noise. So like you, there's, there's always, things to be, uh, to be assessed when you start uh, looking at, uh, at, at public data. Um, one of the tools, in, in the case of IHEC, one of the tools that, that can be used to, to assess this quality, uh, there, there's this correlation tool which enables you to, uh, to, to assess how similar over the whole genome the data sets that, the, the, that interests you are. So by, by using a Pearson correlation test over the, over the whole genome. So I'm giving an example here where for the same cell type and the same assay, one track for RNA-seq weirdly seems anti-correlated to all of the other uh, RNA-seq data, which is uh, highly suspicious. So then you can do your own investigation to figure out why, or you can just choose to, uh, 
not use this data set. Um, the ACI standard working group has been uh, has defined a set of quality metrics to be published by data producers alongside the raw data. So the list of metrics are, are and how to compute them are available at uh, following this link. And this is something that's gradually starting to be published along alongside uh, the data published in IHEC. I just wanted to start to, to talk a bit about the uh, Chrome imputes too. Uh, it's an interesting tool that allows you to uh, input missing signal tracks, but it can, it can also be used to uh, to check if a, 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 a signal track that you have is uh, uh, behaves the way it could be reasonably expected to to, to behave. So, uh, as an input, Chrome Impute uses uh, maybe a, a group of samples, which are uh, for for a a given histo a chip seek histone mark and other marks from the same sample, and then you can you, you can you can compute these tracks, which are are, are expected signal maybe for a given chip, chip seek experiment, and you, you you can you can compare it to your own data set to see if uh, you you get that what you, you would be expecting. It's a, it's a bit uh, of a lab laborious process to uh, to execute though, so we won't cover uh, cover it in, the, in this lab, but. Uh, just good to good to know. Next, I, I want to cover the uh, the challenges of large scale analysis. So, the, when you want to run uh, a data analysis using public data, especially for uh, for large data sets, uh, there there's multiple challenges that you, that you are going to face. Um, one of them is obtaining ac obtaining ac obtaining access, because as I was saying, when you want to uh, access raw data. The first thing you need to do is to write a bit about your project and who you are and, and these kind of things to uh, to a data access committee who will evaluate whether you you uh, <laughs> well maybe you de you deserve to obtain access to the data um, and so so this like depend depending from one consortium to the other from one project to the other uh, the requirements will be uh, highly variable so. In some cases, it's really straightforward. In, uh, in other cases, it can take quite, quite a while. Uh, downloading the data from a control access repository it can prove to be challenging. Uh, within, uh, within IHEC, we've, we've, we've faced that a lot so far. Um, another thing is comparing data sets across projects uh, it can often be difficult, not because the data is not good or anything, just because the way the metadata is is, is stored and, and offered, it can change a lot from one project to the other. Uh, the, f the way the files are organized in the data set can, can, can vary a lot too. So it can take quite a lot of house cleaning, uh, uh, of housekeeping to, 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 uh, to make things uh, work together. And of course, analyzing the data can turn out to be a, a requesting a heavy use of resources, which is why we, we're often using HPCs for such type of analysis. So I'm I'm just showing this slide from uh, coming from uh, Yen Jolie's talk at the last uh, IHEC annual meeting last year, where um, so the, the, there's this um, integrative integrative analysis project within IHEC where we uh, were aiming to uh, download data coming from all of the IHEC member consortium and con consortia and analyze them together with a unified set of pipelines and these things. And it's just to show you, each column here is one IHEC member consortium. The the type of things that are that are requested uh, when you apply to a DAC to actually have access to the to to the data, and so you, you can see like some things like acknowledgments are <laughs> are, are are required by all sides. Uh, that's like uh, if you use my data set, you should you should acknowledge in your paper that it's, that it's coming from us and this kind of thing. In in some cases. There's not so many restrictions, while uh, in, in other cases, a whole lot of, thing, a lot of things, agreements and information need, are, are requested by, by each participant. So as I was saying, download, downloading the data can be a very long endeavor. Uh, for large data sets, uh, downloading the data can take several months, in some cases, even longer than that. <laughs> uh, for big data sets, large amount of space is required. So for instance, to I'll, 
we don't we don't have exact numbers yet, but like to download the whole IHEC data, like over 100 terabytes of, of, of space is exp uh, expected to be needed. And that's just to download the, the, the raw data locally. Once you start, start analyzing it, you'll need much more space than that with all of the uh, intermediate intermediary files and, and so on being generated. Uh, analysis are often uh, processor and memory intensive, so it's not the kind of thing you will uh, run on, on, the, on your own laptop. And several resources exist to address this issue, such as like uh, Compute Canada that we've been using so far, and commercial solutions such as uh, Amazon Web Services and so on. Uh, to, to, to go around, uh, to, to solve these problems, uh, IHEC currently has two initiatives, as I was mentioning, the ASI Standards Working Group, uh, which is also preparing, a, uh, right now, a, a set of unified bioinformatics analysis pipelines. So that means that one of the issues at the moment is like, if you go on a resource such as the IHEC Data Portal and you, uh, you, you want to visualize data coming from the Blueprint Consortium and from the, the, the CERC Consortium in, in Canada. Uh, the problem is that the data generated has been generated with different bioinformatics analysis pipeline, dif different flags, different parameters, which means that the end result can be uh, to, uh, less comparable, let's say. Uh, there, there's, of, of course, by changing the way you analyze your data, the, the output can be very different. and uh, and that's why when IHEC, we're currently preparing pipelines that, that we'll use in the same way for all data sets uh, prepared in the consortium. So that should, uh, that should at least remove a bit of the, uh, of the artifacts in, uh, in, in, in data that you can visualize. Uh, these, these pipelines will be available as singularity containers uh, executable in, uh, in any uh, high-performance uh, high computing environment. There's also the APMAP project, which stands for, uh, which is from the Integrative Analysis Workgroup. The goal of the APMAP project is to prepare a, well, the main goal is to prepare a gold standard data set uh, that can be uh, using the uh, uniform pipelines uh, uh, generated by the Asset Standard Working Group to develop ways to ease access to the data and basically learn, learn by the experience of obtaining all of the IHEC data to try to analyze it and, and, and try to uh, remove obstacles so that the, the, the greater public can download the, the data themselves. So. Okay, so now I'll cover online visualization and, uh, and analysis tools. Um, there's many, uh, many resources are, are available online. So, so far we've done a lot of things at the, at the, at the command line, and we've downloaded tracks to visualize them with IGV. We've covered a bit with Misha the uh, UCSC Genome Browser as well. Um, so in this section, we'll, we'll cover some of the tools that are available for both data discovery and download, uh, data visualization, and, and data, data analysis. So I, I already talked about the IHEC data portals. I'm just giving you an, an overview, and we'll go back to to this on the lab because like uh, the data sets we will use for grade and homework for instance are coming from the portal so we'll learn how to use it how to, to fetch information <laughs> and so on uh, the data is organized in this uh, uh, in this two-dimensional grid where you can uh, the, the, the columns are for each assay uh, offered for a given a given epigenome and the the, the, the the rows are for each uh, for each individual tissue and there's this, uh, this correlation tool I was talking about, basically showing uh, correlation, correlation, how correlated over the whole genome two data sets are. Like we can see in this example that, uh, maybe more like this one, that the uh, four same data sets, like uh, uh, histone, histone marks that are supposed to be anti-correlated are, are, are actually are, and that uh, uh, marks that are supposed to be correlated uh, uh, correlated to each other are, are as well. Uh, the the uh, the portal offers a tool to uh, to download the data. That's what we will use in in, in the lab. Uh, tracks are served directly from the portal server. So like there's a, a yearly snapshots of all of the tracks. So like even if a, a consortium server dies, the consortium disappears, and these things, the tracks will be will be kept for as long as the the portal exists. 
then you can create permanent sessions to, to, to cite, like for instance, to use as a citations in papers that you publish. So like, let's say you made some great finding and you can, uh, you can create a, a NIHEC session to just sit, cite all of the data set that you've used for your analysis. This is the kind of report you can get. Uh, there's a web API to obtain all of the metadata that's connected to a given track, uh, to a given data set. And what's coming ahead in the, in the next couple of months is the ability to create community hubs. So basically this is a way to enable groups which are not main members of IHEC to integrate their own data sets. So let's say you've, got, you've just published a, a paper with like about 20 data sets on H3K4 ME1 and you want their, those to be available to the greater community, uh, there will be a way to integrate that in the portal with information on the paper you publish, your lab, and these kind of things. Uh, I'm going back to the ENCODE portal. The, uh, the, the, and this one is, uh, is uh, displaying data, all the data produced by the different phases of ENCODE, one, two, three, four. Uh, there, there's also this grid showing like uh, for, for different cell type, uh, for, for different assays, uh, what are, what, uh, what's currently available. It's possible to visualize results uh, in the UCSC genome browser, in the Ensemble browser, and, and so on. Uh, the data discovery uh, GTEx, uh, GTEx portal uh, lists, as I was talking about a bit before about the, the, the GTEx consortium, uh, this one is uh, aimed specifically at visualizing results from that consortium, giving uh, different tools to visualize uh, to visualize their data sets. Uh, Deep Blue is very focused on, on epigenomics, so it's 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 a portal that enables you to first discover data that's available from a few of the uh, IHEC member consortia, uh, it, but it, it gives additional tools such as like enable you to build tracks on the fly of regions that interest you. So let, let, let's just say you're interested in one specific region of one chromosome instead of downloading all of the data set over the whole genome on your servers and then doing manually the, the extraction of what interests you. You can use Deep Blue to do that and just say like, I'm interested in this region. I'm interested in, I don't know, a, sp a specific DNA sequence motif and these things. And, and the, the, the portal will enable you to build this data set and just download it, which will be much smaller than if you had to, to just obtain everything. So you can do that either from, a, from its web portal or there's even a, a, an R package that allows you to do that from, from the R uh, language. Uh, we've covered already in the, in, in the workshop uh, the UCSC genome browser, uh, which is a way to visualize annotation tracks of different types of epigenomic assay over the whole genome. Um, so I just wanted to talk quickly about UCSC Genome Browser Track Hubs. So a way, um, maybe, how can I say, you'll come, at, you'll, you'll come at a point where you're, you, from your experiments, you will have generated a set of, uh, a set of annotations that you want to be visualizable in the UCSC Genome Browser. Uh, by creating an AHEC Data Hub, you basically build a site that you can, and you can just provide the, UR, the URL to the UCSC Genome uh, Browser, and it will display your tracks alongside whatever annotation tracks that are available, already available in, in, in the browser. So what you need for that is to put your, uh, the, the big, way, big wig and big, way, big, big bed and, and so on tracks on a given server. You prepare a text document that shows how the, uh, that organizes this data basically, and you can use this URL in the USC browser to display your tracks. So that's what I'm saying here. Uh, you, can use, you can use this to uh, easily distribute your data sets uh, across collaborators and so on. The, the downside is that you need to generate this text document. It can be a bit convoluted at the time. The, 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 uh, I provide the, um, the help to how to do this here. Uh, but as I was saying, it's not, it's not straightforward. You have to generate text file. Let's say like, okay, so I have this track. The type is bigwig. Uh, give some some metadata information about the track so that the UCSC browser knows how to list it properly. Um, just, just to mention, there's now we, we've developed recently a, a tool that allows you to do that in a more automated way from the web interface. So you just answer questions about your data your data sets on a uh, 
on a, on a web portal, and then this will generate for you a USSC Genome Browser Track Hub that you can then load in the browser. Um, beyond the uh, USSC Genome Browser, there's also uh, the EBI that produces the Ensemble Browser that has its own unique set of features. Both browsers are good and bad for different types of uses. There's also the uh, WASH UAP Genome Browser. So bo both of these browsers are also compatible with the UCSC Genome Browser Track Hubs, these documents to display the annotations. So uh, the WASH UAP Genome Browser is a bit more focused on epigenomic assays. So there's a, a bit more features on how to organize data sets uh, more specifically for the, this type of assays. Um, still on the web, there's the, for data analysis, there's the uh, Galaxy platform. Uh, Galaxy is a web, uh, it's a, a web-only framework offering like a, a user-friendly interface to map most uh, popular bioinformatic analysis tools. So like we, we've covered a lot of tools so far in different labs and these things. Um, it's, it's, it's good to have learned how to do it from the common line. Um, in some cases, um, it's, it's like some, like, there's people who like to do stuff from the common line, basically, and there's people who like to do it from, from an interface, asking the questions as, as you need them. Basically. And Galaxy is there for that. So it, it, its motto is data in intensive biology for everyone. So there's a way to, in the same way as you would run steps from the common line, you, you know, like, like we did. You have a data set, you run a tool, you get an output, you put it in another tool, and then that's a series of steps that will be your bioinformatics analysis pipeline. You can do the same kind of things with Galaxy. So you can, um, all, all of these tools from the interface that we will cover uh, will give you a kind of, a, a kind of pipeline, but from, from a, a, a user interface. So it allows, the, 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 the good thing is, it allows for re reproducible results. So one thing, I, I don't remember if, if this has been mentioned so far in, in the workshop, but as you, uh, as you experiment with tools, as you experiment with parameters and these things, uh, it, it's always a good idea to keep a track of what you've done. Like if you run a, a specific software with a given set of flags and these things, um, and then you continue your analysis over the days, and in the end, you get your result. You might come to a point, if you haven't written anything down, where you want to reprodu reproduce your results, but you just can't because you don't remember actually what you did since the beginning. Even if it's not a script, you got to please keep the command. Just a lot of load for the informatics, a lot of load, I guess, with the commands that you use for the project. It's pretty clear. So that's definitely what you should do when you do when you, when you run stuff from, from the common line. Um, from the Galaxy interface, this is some additional freebie where, where like your history is kind of kept for you as you run commands. You have a a history bar that keeps track of everything you've done with the, all the list of par parameters and these things. So it allows you to know exactly what you've done to obtain your data set in the end. And then you can reapply this, re this recipe. You can, you can extract the recipe, the recipe and uh, reapply it to any, uh, any other sample you want in the future. So we'll cover that. I'll talk quickly about, uh, about GenApp. So GenApp is a uh, Canadian computing platform for life science researchers. Uh, it uses the Canary uh, High Speed Network and Compute Canada resources, uh, Compute Canada HPCs. Uh, basically, it's a way for people to use their Compute Canada allocation uh, with tools that are easier and basically web interface tools and this kind of thing. So, uh, it's again, it's free for Canadian academia. All you need is a Compute Canada account. Um, GenApp also offers a set of bioinformatics analysis pipelines. If you're more from the, uh, of the, the type to use things from the common line, uh, these pipelines include uh, for RNA-seq, RNA-seq de novo, ChIP-seq, uh, methyl-seq, which is the same as for as whole genome bisulfite sequencing. All of these, same as the software we've been using in the lab so far, are available as pre-installed components on Compute Canada resources. So I'll just provide the URL here if you're interested to know more. I'll go back to, uh, to, GenApp Gal to, to, to Galaxy. So um, GenApp has this, its own flavor of Galaxy to run the Galaxy tool using your Compute Canada allocation. So 
in the same way as you'd be running tools from the command line and eating, you're gradually using your allocation, you can do the same from Galaxy. And it's, well, yeah, it's just saying it's, it's, it's a bit faster than usegalaxy.org because usegalaxy is the main Galaxy website where everybody is, is connecting, the resources are a bit more limited. If you have a, a beefy allocation at Compute Canada, then maybe it's the, the, the right place to use things. Uh, if, if you're interested to use this and you have a Compute Canada account, you can basically go to genapp.ca and use your login password from Compute Canada, and this will work directly into genapp. And then you're ready to go. You can instantiate your own Galaxy and, and, and start using it. Uh, there's another resource called Data Hub, which is basically this, this place where you can put your own UCSC Genome Browser Track Hub with your tracks and your things. You can just deposit it them there if you don't have a web server to serve your tracks and that they will, uh, they will take care of that for you. And so, yeah, I, I want to spend the rest of the presentation to, uh, to explore with you the Galaxy web platform. So Galaxy, as I was saying, it integrates hundreds of tools which are typically used from the common line interface. Uh, these are from basic file operations, like, I don't know, I have a tab delimited uh, file, I want to remove one specific column, uh, or these kind of things, to complex analysis jobs. So all of the tools we've covered so far in this workshop, whether it's FastQC, uh, that, um, you know, Max2, and, and so on, they're available from the Galaxy interface as well. So, yes? Did you use the the main uh, like you use Galaxy dot uh, org or something? I I I think you get. I think the basic allocation unless it changed was like a fifty or one hundred yeah, gigabytes or something like that. So. Maximum, but, and it, it said it was uploading, it just never really I'm not I'm not sure if Galaxy has a, a, an issue with very large files. I know like in the case of many many web resources when the file is higher than than two gigabytes, uh, for some technical reason, there, there's there's an issue to uh, to complete the transfer. Um, well, if I may say, this is this is not you shouldn't face that issue specifically with the GenApp Galaxy uh, instance. We, we've tested it with much larger files, and uh, so it's. But yeah, I mean, there there can be tons of reasons why why yeah. the download the download completed. It's, it's sometimes a bit hard to investigate, but uh, yeah, I mean. Right. Yeah. But one nice thing with the Galaxy instance on GenApp that he's talking about is the bypass of some of those challenges. Yeah. yeah. So like, there, there's a way either to you to do the upload from the web interface, or you can just dump your files in your Compute Canada directory and that instance of Galaxy will just find them, so there, there wouldn't be this transfer issue that you're having. Yeah, this is not the word. Okay. So, yeah, there's a, again, they, there can be many reasons that have to be eliminated one by one. Um, so, as uh, I was saying, most of the tools that you might want to use, I mean, most of the main tools are available from the Galaxy interface. And in the case of GenApp Galaxy, all compute jobs are using your yearly all allocation and you get a report from the web interface about the, the status and, and these kind of things. Uh, so each tool has its own interface to input the parameters that you may, might want to provide with, with your execution. For instance, uh, just showing the, uh, the FastQC uh, quality control tool can be executed from Galaxy and you can consult the report in the same way without having to move from the cluster to your own computer and these kind of things so this can be a kind of shortcut. Uh, Galaxy also allows for pipeline design so you would, there's a graphical user interface that allows you to stick pieces together and just say okay so I have I have this fast queue and what I want is 
a, a big wig showing the coverage of my RNA-seq experiment. And you can just plug the pieces uh, from one software to the other, where like basically after that you just have to run your workflow on the basic file and you'll obtain your, uh, your track at, at, at the end without much more user involvement. So, and yeah, I'm saying like, get, get, uh, Galaxy uh, gradually evolves too. There's always new versions. The newer versions allow to do much more things such as uh, inputting, uh, running the same pipeline over a large amount of files instead of having to redo the same thing again and again. Just a quick walkthrough of the interface. So um, each tool ha has its own input interface. Uh, I'm giving the, ex the example of BWA for, for alignment here. And the reason why I use this one is uh, I, I like what it's saying at the bottom here where you have to know what you're doing even if you're not running the tool from the common line. Uh, it's the same in Galaxy. You input parameters as, uh, as Martin was saying in his presentation, uh, it's garbage in, garbage out. So like if you don't know the tools and you're just using the defaults uh, for all tools without understanding the parameters, probably the answer you'll get at the end is not what you're looking for. So that does, using Galaxy doesn't remove the need to understand what parameters for the tools are doing. So uh, from the, uh, from the, uh, the left sidebar, there, there's an interface to list all the tools that exist. There's a filtering option. So if you know specifically I want to use BWA, it will list all the tools uh, which are involved with BWA. That's a kind of shortcut. Uh, there's different tools to get data, either from uh, uploading from your web browser, you can uh, extract annotations from sites such as the UCSC Genome Browser. Uh, for example, you can obtain, if you want to do something with the list of common variants from dbSNP for a specific version or something, you can do that. And yeah, so I wanted to do a, a, a quick walkthrough of the interface of Galaxy. Uh, yeah, before uh, before we move to the lab, uh, so is it? Yeah. Okay. So this is the the instance of Galaxy we'll be using for the lab today, uh, which is uh, running on on GenApp resources. So it's an instance of an instance of a GenApp Galaxy, but running on the same server that you've been using common line uh, so far in your in, in your labs. So as I was saying, on the left side, there's a list of all, uh, all tools available within Galaxy categorized by types of tool. And you can filter out, let's say I, I was looking for BWA, then it's filtering the tools the way, the way, I, the way I want them. Uh, the, the, the main, um, the, the central window is the place where you will, in, for instance, input your parameters, visualize your results, and so on. Uh, and the sidebar here is the, uh, the, the history bar. This is what I was talking about, that like, it gives you the list of all of the steps that, you, that you've executed in your analysis with the parameters and, and, and so on. There's, um, so, maybe I'll just. So I'll give you just a, a small example. Let's say I want to download from the UCSC uh, table browser uh, the list of common variants for, let's say, a chromosome Y or something like that. Well, maybe I went a bit fast now. I, from the interface, I'll go to get data. And then there's this option where I can download all types of annotation from UCSC using the table browser. So if I click here. And it will show me the interface. Now I'll say what I'm looking for are the list of variants. And I'll download the list of common SNP, for instance. It's just to show you a small example of tool execution. And then I'll say I want all common SNPs for, let's say, something not too big, so chromosome Y. And then it'll look up. It will take the whole uh, the whole chromosome. And then once I'm ready, I'll get the output and send the query to Galaxy. And now I have a, a task that 
appears on my history so, uh, on my history bar. Uh, there's different colors for that. When when the task is gray, it means it's waiting before being executed. Yellow means it's running at the moment. So right now, Galaxy is fetching the information. And one, once a once an item becomes green, that means uh, it was uh, successfully executed. If it's red, that means something crashed, something went on, <laughs> something went on, and then you need to check the report. So by clicking here, you'll be able to uh, to to get more information. For instance, uh, by uh, by clicking the little eye information here, and then I can just visualize my results if it's a text file or an HTML file, for instance. So these are the common snips that I ask for chromosome Y in a bed in a bed tabular format. And yeah, so as you execute more tools on this, then these will be added on the bar and then you will be able to run work uh, to extract the step that you did and to build a workflow out of it and to reapply it to other samples that those are things that I will cover at the end of the lab. So uh, we'll, we'll soon, soon we will start the lab and at the end I will redo it with you and I'll show you additional, uh, uh, additional tips on how to make your Galaxy experience better. <coughs> so to, to, to conclude the, uh, the, 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 presentation, the presentation, uh, in this model, we've covered like some type of downstream analysis with epigenomic data, how to obtain publicly accessible data sets for your own analysis, uh, some of the challenges of using public data sets, how to visualize data sets using online tools, and some tools to do things not from the common line, but from a web interface. Uh, the lab will cover Homer, Great, Galaxy, and uh, explore a bit how to use the, the IHEC data portal to discover data sets. Uh, I include here the link to the main Galaxy server. It's uh, it's a accounts are for free. As I, as I was saying, I think it's you get about fifty or one hundred gigabytes to upload things. So it gives you enough space to get started, but not to run like full fledged analysis over a, a lot of samples. But at least uh, give you a feel of of things. And so if you didn't get the message already from, uh, from the presentation, if you're in Canadian Academia, get a Compute Canada account and maybe get an app account to start using tools such as Galaxy. So would that be on your default account? I'm sorry? Is that It's using your own allocation, yes, exactly. So if you get a certain amount of compute cycles, you will use that as a, yes? So are you Mm -hmm. as well as using the Galaxy. Yep. How does the It's, they're both using the scheduler. So, so even, you don't really see it in the Galaxy, but in the back, you use yep. or whatever it is. Yeah, 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 yeah. So we, we will submit job in the scheduler in the, in the same way. So uh, there shouldn't be, uh, unless you have a special situation where you have different allocations for the same lab and these things. The, the, the usual case is they will all go toward the same allocation and kind of compete for <laughs> for resources. And Galaxy can estimate the wall time and memory all of that. There's itself. yes, there's a set of parameters which are good for most of the cases. Uh, you might have situations where very large data set, data files are hitting the the, the, uh, the wall time. If that's the case, I encourage you to contact the uh, the Gen App support, and this is this is the kind of things that can work out with you to make it work with your own uh, data. So.